Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames played four games in the last seven days, but we're only able to come back with three points. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're back to break down the week that was for the Flames. Matt, overall thoughts from this week? Well, it ended good. That's about the only positive thing I can say is that the last game was good. I think that when I look at this week, I think part of it was bad puck luck for the Flames, and I think, you know, they I would say they probably lost two games. We'll talk, we'll break these down individually, but probably two games due to bad puck luck, and I think the Vancouver game was sort of the makeup for that. Yeah, and it's getting to the point in the season where excuses are drawing thin and results need to be put up on the board, and three points in out of eight simply won't cut it. Well, let's break these down, and then we'll talk about some overall thoughts on where we are after what we've seen. Starting the week, the Calgary Flames lost uh, 2-1 to one to the Minnesota Wild. This was a shootout game, and I was surprised that Matt Cullen scored the 250th goal of his career. I didn't even know the guy was still playing. He's got to be almost as old as Yager now, but uh, Cullen scored and Furland scored in regular time here, and then the, uh, the Wild put it away in the shootout. Any thoughts on this game, Matt? Well, just bad luck, mostly. Uh, that overtime, the Flames could have scored three or four times in it and normally would have. Furland missed a wide-open net in regulation. There was like three wide-open nets the Flames missed in this one. Yeah, it's that was a bad luck game. And it if you play that one a hundred times, the Flames probably win 97, 98 of them. It's just unfortunately... They didn't get the result, and the shootout it wasn't very good for the Flames shooters, and the, a couple of the shooters seemed to have gotten a little into, well, this worked before, let's keep going to that same well, and goalies are quickly able to adapt and react to, oh, you're doing this this way now? Okay. So, it... I think all of the shooters on the next shootout have to try something a little different to shake things up. Yeah, the shooters were Johnny Goudreau, who got a goal, Sean Monaghan, who did not, Kachuk, who did not, and Bennett, who did not, and Furland, who did not. So, yeah, and I mean, we've seen, I mean, even Kachuk, it's pretty much the same move every time. And I think with the video scouting the NHL does these days, you can't keep going back to the well over and over. No, like, you can do similar things, it's just you have to, like, have a different finish to it, even just once in a while, just to get goalies off their game, because, like, if they're expecting it to go high glove each time, well, you just know that, okay, give them the high glove and then react. When you see the stick move, just throw your glove up and you'll get it, so... It's one of those things that they just got to shake things up a bit and they'll be fine. I thought going into the shootout, I mean, we have to remember that we saw two different goaltenders play for Minnesota. We saw Dubnik play the first 20 minutes and then Staylock play the next 45. But I really thought going into overtime in the shootout, the Flames would be able to beat Staylock. Yeah, so did I. And uh, credit to him. He had a good game. Uh, it is what it is. The Flames just couldn't solve the backup goaltender. And they should be better than what they're doing, but games like that happen when you're struggling. I think the big disappointing thing to me at the time was that Minnesota was the team that was chasing us in the standings, and we needed those two points to propel ahead of them. Yep, and that that's the key to this week is just coughing up points left, right, and center. And not like we have in the past Eastern teams, but these, and we'll talk about the next team as well, the team that's right ahead of us in the standings, these are teams that if we cough up points, it hurts us. Well, the next game we played against the San Jose Sharks, who at the time were right ahead of us in the standings, and we saw Aaron Dell play a pretty good game in this, the Sharks goaltender, and the Flames ended up losing 3-2 to two in this one in regulation. Um, I don't know, I... I don't know what to say about this one. I think it was, to me, the Flames played a good game. I don't think it's the best game of the year, but they played a pretty solid road game. But I think they had bad puck luck. Uh, Again, you need to put results up. And giving up that late goal 
with a couple minutes left in the game, it, it's just, like, even if they would have got it to overtime, that would have been sufficient. But, again, coughing up points needlessly, especially to divisional rivals that you're right against in the standings, uh, doesn't help you at all <laughs> when it comes time for the playoffs. The thing I will credit the Flames in both these games was they did a pretty good job of staying out of the penalty box. In the uh, Wild game, they only had four penalty minutes. In the San Jose game, they had six. So they're not, as we've talked about in the past, they're not giving up a lot of penalty time to their opponents. No, and when they are giving up penalties, they're not giving up a, a ton of power play goals against either, which is helping. It's... The vast majority of the Flames' problem is that they can't score, and it seems like each line has gone into a bit of a slump in terms of generating offense, and although that did break through against Vancouver, it's been a theme heading all the way back towards the beginning of the month and into last month, where... Like, if the Gaudreau line isn't on fire, usually the Flames are coming up losers in that game so the secondary scoring's good but it's still secondary yeah and if the the flames aren't getting a four point game from sam bennett like in the vancouver game it, there's just nothing and it's you need other people contributing like matt kachuk has only scored a couple of goals in the like the last 15 games it, everybody seems to be just a little out of sorts, and it that is the crux of the problem. Like, they've tightened up sufficiently on defense, but now they're not generating any offense, and they need to get that balance where they're doing well in their own zone and scoring, and the, the, then wins will come. It's just it you're either getting a lot of offense from Gaudreau's line or you're getting decent defense and you're not getting any consistent play from anybody. Well, let's talk a little bit about the two extremes on that, which are the next two games. On December 16th, the Nashville Predators swept their three-game Western Canadian road trip and beat the Flames 2-0 in Calgary. Pekka Rene registered his 46th career shutout. I don't know what to say about this one. I thought, you know, honestly, for the for most of the game, I thought the Flames played well. I thought the Flames played competitively to play against a good team like Nashville. I think Nashville's one of the top teams in the NHL this year. And I, I thought we were competitive. But again, the Flames just didn't have enough finish in this one. And that's exactly it. And for a lot of games lately, they've been all right. Like there, You can look at, you know, and if it was a one-off, you'd be going, well, that was a good effort, but and they came up short. Oh, well, go win the next one. But they've been doing that pretty much for the, the last, like, 15 games where decent efforts where you can't say, oh, like, Mark Barkowski made a bad turnover and that cost us the game. Or, you know, or, like, It was Smith a good effort, up. but just not good enough. We can't keep saying we've hit a hot goalie. Like, not every goaltender that comes in here can be hot. Pekka Rene is a good goaltender. This is regular Pekka Rene. Yeah, it's not like he was standing on his head. The Flames hit the post five or six times in the game. Like, it, he was beatable. It's just, it, the team seems to be getting in their own way in terms of generating offense, and it's just frustrating to see because you can see that they're doing well. And elements of their game is coming together. It's just... They need to, you know, you're running out of time to, like, if you're wanting to be more than a, like, 7th, 8th seed in the NHL, or in the West, you know, you need to start winning a lot of games so that way you can get up into be, vying towards being one of the top, you know, home ice advantage and all that stuff. And, you know, the clock's running low. You gotta go now and to make up ground and this waffling of oh well they played well but they didn't get some bounces well that's not good enough 
One thing I will say, and again, I'm not trying to make excuses for the team, but one of the things I did notice here is, I mean, the Flames were in the penalty box for 25 minutes, and that really shakes up your lineup when you've got that many guys, you know, cycling in on the penalty box. So I could see in this one that there wasn't as much chemistry as we'd usually have because of the line changing, and I don't want to say that that's why they lost because the Predators had the same, but you could definitely tell that there is a little bit less comfort with some of the guys in the ice. I agree. Everybody seemed a little bit out of sorts and not comfortable with each other at times throughout the game. So I can't. Yeah, and if you look at the time on ice, there was a lot of guys who played more minutes than they probably should have. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, I'm not making an excuse, but just an observation on this game. Um, I found it interesting. Troy Brower played the least minutes of the whole team at seven minutes thirty six seconds of short of regular time time on ice. Uh, 13 seconds on the power play and 1 minute 11 seconds shorthanded. So, you know, even seeing some of that, it's just looking at these numbers, there is some interesting... I mean, yeah, you got to do what you got to do, right? You've only got so many guys to play, but I think that was part of it too. And if we didn't have as many penalties, I think we might have seen some different from the Flames. But let's talk about the game that capped off the week. The Flames took a quick trip to Vancouver where they took on the Canucks. We beat the Canucks 4-2 to two earlier in the month. And this time, the Flames slaughtered the Canucks 6-1 to one with backup goaltender David Riddick in net. Anything really to say on this one besides it's nice to see a slaughter? They were getting some bounces. and They were. This is where the puck lock that they didn't get all week came back to them. Yeah, and okay, they won a game 6-1. Awesome. Go do it again several times in a row. And you know get some flow going to your game you scored on the power play you got a bunch of goals from a bunch of different people i think every line scored a goal good roll with it and hopefully the team can start getting on a roll because of this and i find it interesting that now david riddick has had three starts in his career and now has three wins and has looked very good in each of the games perhaps it would be a good thing if he played more yeah no he's he i was curious to see how he was going to look in this one the first two yeah he looked good and you're going okay is this guy for real or was it two you know two lucky games, but I agree with you. I think he's looking good. I think he needs to play more. And I think now that they have confidence in their backup, you will see him play more than just the back-to-backs. Yeah, because you have to look at Mike Smith. For the last month or so, he's been giving up some really soft goals at, at times. Uh, like Especially the two goals that he gave up to Nashville were both rather bad goals <laughs> in my mind. So... The fact that he's starting to give up those bad goals, he needs to not play as much. And, like, in his last seven starts, he has an 891 save percentage. Like, that's not good enough. And if you have somebody else who's playing well, throw him in there. And, you know, the Flames need points. And if Riddick is the guy that's doing it, do it. And, you know, if Smith plays as the backup for a bit, it. And while Riddick goes on a run, so be it. It, it, You know, when you get to the playoffs, having Smith play like 70 games is not good for him. And because he will be burnt out by then. And that will pretty much screw the Flames season if he plays that much all year. So the Flames need to get the goalies other goalies in there more often and if Riddick's doing a good job which he has through three starts let's see what he's got yeah and just looking ahead we've still got a back-to-back on the 28th and 29th when the Flames are in San Jose and then back at the Honda Center so he'll play one of those for sure Um, then they have another back-to-back Tampa Bay Florida in early January and another back-to-back in late January 24th 25th LA Edmonton so I think that you'll definitely see him in all of those, but I think you're right. You've got to rest him where you can. And looking at some of these teams coming up, I think there's definitely a chance for Riddick to try. I wouldn't say to steal a game, but I think that there's some competitive games to put Riddick in and say, all right, we're giving you this one because you've looked good. Show us what you can do. I'd be tempted to put him in against Montreal. That was exactly, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say I'd put Smith in against St. Louis and I'd have 
Riddick in against Montreal, and if Riddick has another good game, then maybe uh, the first game or the second game after Christmas, throw him in again and see how it goes. Well, the two after Christmas are back to back, so you'll be in one of those. But the other thing too, as you're mentioning, I think Smith needs a break. Like we're just seeing that he's looking like he's overworked. And if you put Riddick in in Montreal, that gives Smith seven days with the Christmas break, the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th. And if you don't play him on the 28th, the first back-to-back, that's eight days to recover. I don't see any, you know, I don't see any need to play him in Montreal. Yeah, we need the win, but it's also giving up points to a Eastern Conference team if we do. I think that's a perfect time to give David Riddick the start. I agree, and if he does well, then you add that to the information you already have, and okay, maybe you throw Riddick in a handful more times in the next couple of weeks than you normally would have. And it it's just a good idea, if you have a goalie that's playing well, to play them. The interesting thing, I'm just looking ahead at the schedule, all of the back-to-backs that we have left... The second game is always on the road, and Riddick seems to play very well away from the Dome. We haven't seen him at the Dome to know what he's going to do here, but maybe you just keep playing him on the road. Yeah. So um, just leave Mike Smith in Calgary and then just have Riddick on the road. And There you go. Jordan Siglet can back him up on the road. Then Smith will get lots of rest. No, but I mean, it's you know it would also be a nice kind of Christmas treat for the Flames fans to see him in Montreal at the Dome as well. Mm-hmm. I think that this... The biggest thing I took out of the Vancouver game was, as you mentioned, everyone was getting points. I mean, we saw, you know, Jankowski get his sixth, Giordano get his fifth and sixth, Kachuk get his seventh, Bennett get his fifth, Furland get his 13th. Like, everyone was getting points. And I'm hoping that, you know, Stajan got his first point of the year. I'm hoping this kind of kickstarts some of these guys. And we've seen earlier in the season that sometimes when guys get one or two points, they get going. And I think that's what the Flames need right now. And if they can parlay this into everyone getting going i think they could solve some of their woes yeah and the main frustration with this team is that everybody seems to be a little off in their game and you can see like when they're having everybody going in the same direction at the same time the game against vancouver like they just absolutely steamrolled the other team and if they can get on a roll where you have different lines contributing then hopefully that will translate into plenty of wins and this team starting to look more like what i think everybody expected them to be instead of in 11th i think they are now so not not exactly the best first couple months of the season, for sure. No. And let's just let's look at that. So the Calgary Flames right now sit two spots out of a wild card spot at 37 points. Chasing right behind us is Anaheim at 36 and Vancouver at 34. We're tied with Minnesota, one outside of a wild card spot. And as much as that sounds bad, if you look at how tight the Western Conference is, and we kind of knew it would be coming into the year, I mean, we've got Dallas at 38, Chicago at 39, both wildcard, and San Jose, who's the third team in the Pacific, 38 points. Um, Vegas is number one somehow, and LA is tied with them, but I mean, we're one point out of third in the Pacific. So I think that usually when you're out of a playoff spot, you worry a bit, but the way I'm seeing is we're flip-flopping so much every game. I don't worry too much about where we are, if we're in or not. What I am worried about, though, Matt, and you tell me what you think, every year we've seen the Flames go on like an 8- or 10-game losing streak. I think if we see that this year, that could spell the end for this team. Well, I'm hoping that the bad streak of the season has already happened. Because, honestly, if they lose like four or five more in a row at any point, I think that you're looking at disaster zone you know, flames, you know, fire sale at the deadline uh, and, like, just a stupid dark timeline in Flames history if that happens, so. But at the same time every year, we also see the Flames generally go on a big win streak, like an 8- or 10-game win streak. And again, I think if they can do that, that could really change their fortunes. So I think right now you've either got to win a lot or keep sort of, you know, winning a couple, losing a couple, but... 
the biggest thing this team can't afford. And I say it because we're I'm getting close to January, and usually it seems like our big losing streak comes in January. We can't afford four games or more in a row. With how tight this Western Conference is, that could be the end of us. Yeah, and like it's sort of like our shows from last year. And like in January, we were both like, "Okay, let let's talk about the draft," <laughs> you know, uh, because it didn't look like the Flames were going to make the playoffs, and it, it looked like it was going to be another crap season. And it, you know, we can't even do that this year because of the fact that we don't have a first round or a second round pick. So it's. Just to put into perspective how tight the West is, Arizona's the only team that's out of it. I mean, they're at 19 points. So there's no way they're coming back. But Edmonton is at 30 points. Colorado's at 32. Calgary's at 37. So, you know, I mean, we've seen Edmonton go on a bit of a lucky streak lately. And I think it just shows how with a little bit of luck in a tight Western conference, you can change your fortunes quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and last year it took the Flames winning, I think it was like 14 of 17 in order for them to like get, get back into the playoff hunt properly. And like, frankly, right now, even though the playoff pitcher is rather close, in order to get up towards the top of the division, the Flames are currently nine points out of first in the Pacific. And it's going to take that kind of a streak again just to get back into that kind of conversation. And you're looking at between Vegas and L.A., you're they're so far ahead now of everybody that you're not... It's getting to the point now where if they the Flames do not start going on a win streak in short order then you're basically kissing home ice advantage away again, and you're just setting up the dominoes for the Flames having yet another disappointing season where they underperformed and more questions get raised about the direction of the team and all that kind of fun BS that nobody wants to... You know, we'd like to have a season where perhaps we have a good run on things and actually challenge for the Stanley cup instead of just being, you know, getting a participation trophy. (laughs) I think this is going to be a playoff standings race that comes down to late March. I don't think you're going to see any Pacific conference team, or I wouldn't say any, I don't think you'll see that third spot clinched until late March or April. I think it's going to be so tight you have to stay in this all season. Usually three, you see all three spots sort of sewn up by, I'd say the deadline or a week or so after, but I think this could come right down to the wire. Yeah. And one good thing is that Calgary has yet to play the Las Vegas Golden Knights. And I think they've only played Los Angeles once. So if they're wanting to make up ground, especially next month, they play them twice. I do believe it, it will help to get some points on the board against those teams, and that will help to shrink the deficit very quickly, in fact, if they can go on a winning streak against those two teams. Yeah, they play the uh, Kings twice, both at home, once on the 4th and once on the 24th. And you and I were talking about this before we went on the air. It's weird this year how the NHL is doing the scheduling. Like, you know, last year we were done all the Edmonton games by December, And now it seems like they're trying to get series done quickly. Like, you know, we played Montreal, both of our games in the series this month, and now we're over it, moving on. And then, you know, we haven't seen a division rival, which is Vegas, until January. It's just kind of a weird scenario. Yeah, like we're done with Vancouver now. It is weird. Uh, I've never seen a schedule quite this bizarre. I mean, I kind of like it with the Eastern teams. You know, like you see, okay, we saw Toronto twice in three weeks. We saw Philly. We've seen both of our games this month against Montreal. I kind of like that because you remember what's gone on. You know, you kind of remember last game. I know there's been times we played a team like in November and then again in April. And you're like, I don't remember that last game. So it sort of builds those rivalries a bit. But it's weird that with a divisional rival like Vegas, we don't see them till halfway through. Mm Mm-hmm. And we've got a game against them every month after that. In fact, our last game of the year is against Vegas. 
Yeah, so hopefully Vegas cools off by now then and you know, we can they'll be ripe for the picking. Well if I if I remember correctly, I'd have to look at the stats. Vegas I think is better at home than they are on the road. Yeah, they're thirteen two and one at home, which and is eight seven I, and one on the road. Yeah, which I do believe is the best record in the NHL right now. Yeah, it is. Uh they're tied with Tampa. Yeah, it's number one but tied for number one. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens the rest of this month. But Matt, looking at where we were, um, you know, you and I have had our ups and our downs. We've had our highs and our lows so far. We're about 40% of the way through the season. The Flames have played 34 games as of the time we record this. Right now they're at 17 wins, 14 losses, three overtime losses for a total of 37 points. What are your overall thoughts now at the 40% marker? Uh, this team has been a severe disappointment in my books. I think they're about 10 points below where they should be, and it's not really acceptable. Uh, the team went all in to be a contender this year, and they're in 11th or 10th, and like that's just, it, there's no sugarcoating it. It's a disaster. Uh, and when you have three good lines, the defense core that they have, and a starting goaltender who's not terrible, that's where they are right now it, that just should not happen and that's why like a, a couple of weeks ago on the show i suggested perhaps looking at changing the coaching staff because something has to change and like we're seeing them play a little bit better of late but it's not really getting any results in terms of the standings and if that doesn't change soon the, they will will have to make some sort of change, and the quick easy one is that one. Uh, you can make trades, but midseason trades are always a little risky just due to the fact that most of the time you're overpaying if you're desperate, which the Flames currently are. We did a poll a couple weeks ago about where the team's at, and a lot of people thought that one of the things we could do to change this team was to shake up the lineup a bit instead of making a trade or firing the coach. So why don't we look at two scenarios that you and I have been thinking about, and then we'll look at a third one somebody posed to us. Matt, you've been talking about breaking up the 3M line. That's what we've come to know as the second line of Kachuk, Backlund, and Froelich. Um, do you still think that's a good idea? Yes. And where would you see those guys going? Well, Kachuk hasn't played well uh, with Backland or Froelich this season in terms of generating offense and uh, I'd almost like to see him remain with Backland but swap Yager onto that line uh, move Froelich down to the fourth line and just roll with things as is interesting because I was almost thinking of keeping Backland and Froelich and putting Lazar on that line yeah that uh, the thing is, that would neuter the offense, I think, of that line entirely, because I don't think Yeah, that... at that point, they become your shutdown defensive line. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, you could always do that and, like, bump the Bennett line up a line where they become the second line. It just... It puts a lot more pressure on Bennett and Jankowski to be awesome, though, and that it makes things a little bit more difficult. I can see, I can understand why maybe it's time to try breaking them up. My my worry, though, is as you're saying, where do we put them? I mean, you know, we could, do we put Froelich? We need a first-line right winger. Do we maybe try Froelich on the first line? Could be. We saw at the end of last year some good chemistry there with him and Monaghan. It could, it wouldn't hurt. You know, with Furland being inconsistent, it doesn't hurt to be able to say swap Yager, swap for leak, swap anybody basically into that spot and see if anything works. Because just because something didn't work before doesn't mean that it won't now. You got to give it a try. Yeah, exactly. And it's like the Flames tried Bennett as a center. It didn't work. They moved him to the wing. It did work. And okay, that's good. Now you have a definite spot there. And 
it's just a matter of the Flames seeing if they can generate chemistry in other ways than what has been working before but isn't currently now. Well, we're not saying they even have to break them up forever and ever, but what if we just try it for a game, see what we think, if we like it, keep them apart again, if we don't, put them back together. Exactly, and sometimes just getting a fresh look is enough to spark things again, so who knows? It, it's they got to do something, though, with because some of the players are doing well, but it's just not clicking for them. I think we've got great scoring talent on this forward line. I just think that right now the the threesomes that we have maybe are a bit mismatched, and I think we need to move some scoring around. I don't think that with the lineup we have and the way we have guys, we're going to get all the secondary scoring we need. No, and the, the main problem the Flames have is they've got an excellent left winger and an excellent center on the first line, the second line, and the third line. And there's no right winger on any of those lines. And I think that's part of the problem that the Flames are running into is that organizationally, the lack of right wing talent is really hurting the team. And year in, year out, they don't really address it. And it's a become a major problem because even in the prospect pool they don't really have anybody other than spencer foo who's a legitimate prospect that's a right shooting right winger it's funny after guys like you know theo who's a right winger and jerome who's a right winger it's almost like now we're shying away from right wingers yeah and like if you keep like bennett jankowski kachuk backland gaudreau monahan like those are perfect pairings it's just there's literally nothing on the right side for any of those lines and that is like each of the guys that's there is not on par with their line mates and that's the problem like for leak is not as good as backland and kachuk and because of the weakness of the, that it makes the flames a little easier to defend against because you almost don't have to worry about the right winger as much and you can focus on the two good players and it makes it a lot more difficult to generate offense when you're not having a third option on on those lines where you have an equivalent talent and granted the third line has worked well because Hathaway is a bit of a pain to play against and he makes his own space and I think that's part of the reason why he's clicked in that line. Uh, because he's good enough to pass the puck, at least with Janko and uh, Bennett. So it, the gulf between the talent level isn't quite the same on that line. But on the other two lines, like frankly, Furalik has played more like a third or fourth line forward for this season. And that's not bad. I'm not saying he's played poorly. It's just he's not a top six forward. And Michael Furland, yeah, he does generate some offense every once in a while, but he's not a first line forward. And until the Flames can address that by getting a legitimate th player in those spots, the team's going to have a little bit of frustrations because of that. No, I mean, the team has tried, right? We threw a lot of money at Froelich. We thought he'd be our number one right winger. Then we threw a lot of money at um, Brower and thought he'd be the number one right winger. So, I don't know. It's like they're trying, but I don't know that you solve this just by going to the free agent market. And I don't know what we do at this point, but I agree. There needs to be some more depth on the right. And if you're going to make a trade, that might be a good way to go about it. But you and I also talked, too, the one piece we can see them trading is a right winger. It's one of those situations where, because there have been rumors about Evander Kane, and while I'm not a fan of him, he is a legitimate... He's a bona fide right winger. Yeah, and at this point, it's getting to the point where it, they need to, between now and next year, get at least one good right winger in the organization and like it just has to be one like you, it, you can get another one but it's not 
necessary to get two top six right wingers. It they just need one for sure, and you can get by with guys like Froelich and Yager and Brower on the right wing, or you know variations therein in your second and third and fourth line. But it it just they really do need to get something there especially with the flames defense core being as frankly stacked as it is that could be a way to go about it it's just it has to be the right deal and it has to make sense i think at this point as much as i hate to say it because they've overspent i think it's gonna end up being a free agent acquisition yeah, so do I. And I just hope that they don't get rid of Backlund because Jankowski's doing good. <laughs> yeah, but I think both those guys can stay on the team. I mean, Janko's cheap. It's not like he's, you know, going to get a ton of money there. I think you'll be able to keep both of them. Yeah, it's just that they may prioritize the right winger at the expense of Backlund, and that wouldn't be a good idea. I don't think you're going to see that. Yeah. Um, but let's, while we're talking about that, let's talk about some right wingers who are available. Um, and, and in July, pending they don't re-sign, give me a yay or nay on these guys. Patrick Hornquist. Could do, but we'd need better. I, I He's all right, but... I think Hornquist could work on a one- or two-year deal. Um, Who else is on this list that's interesting? Yannick Hansen? Nah, really. He, he's not very good, so... It, that would be just like getting another Froelich or Brower. It's like, oh, you know, you can do that, but it's not. Yeah, there's not really any high-end right-wingers on this list. The one guy I do see on the list, depending free agents on the right side, not saying for the first line, but Chris Stewart, I could see coming in to replace for Stieg. Yeah. But there's really no high-end. I mean, you know, we're, we don't want to make a play for an RFA. We don't have any picks for that. There's some interesting RFAs, but... Yeah, I think it's going to have to be solved either through, you know, some sort of a off-season deal or a free one of the free agent deals on those few guys and because there are so few, you know, the price are going to be high and I really don't want them to pay overpay for another right winger. Yeah, and that's where you have the good defensemen that the Flames do have. It is possible where you could get a legitimate right winger for a legitimate defenseman. Sort of like uh, the Larson for Hall type trade. But at this point, who do you trade? Do you trade Brody? I don't know. Uh, that's the... It would... I think number one is, who are you getting? And then, you know, like it, depending on the name... It might be worth it to get move Hamilton. It might be move it right to move Brody. It, it depends, and there are. It just depends on who you're talking about, and if it's like a a decent second line right winger, well, I wouldn't go to that extent. <laughs> uh, that'd be more like prospects. But if you can get a top notch, like a almost like a Phil Kessel caliber, not somebody that age, but you know what I mean, where a legitimate scorer as a right winger for a good defenseman, then sort of like the Seth Jones trade or the Larson trade, where you're getting a scoring forward for a good defenseman. And I think that the Flames, because of the luxury that they have, not only having... Giordano, Hamilton, Brody, Hamannick, and Stone. They've also got Shillington and Anderson, both of whom could probably slot into the NHL right now without really skipping much of a beat. They can probably slot in, but I don't think they could slot in top four. And if you trade, you know, Brody, you're missing a top four defenseman. I think Stone could do it for a year, but I think it. the Flames need to find... I don't think Stone's a legit top four for a long term. No, but that you can address in other ways and like even if it's a free agent signing that mm -hmm. there's options it's easier to get find a 3-4 defenseman than it is a scoring right winger right at this point and like if the free agents market was different or the trading market was different then 
you'd go that route, but the, the Flames do have the benefit of having a deep prospect pool in that position and a surplus at the NHL level where you can maneuver to make your team better. It's it, literally what Nashville did getting Johansson for Seth Jones just due to the fact that they had so many good young defensemen as it was that they were able to do that without really skipping a beat on their defense core. So looking at that, the only team I could see right now who might want to make a trade like that would be Toronto. Yeah, and not, you know, get Nylander. Nylander, I'm even thinking Kapanen. Yeah, uh, that, I don't think he's that good. Like, I, I, w- I would trade one of the prospects for, like, I'd, I'd trade Shillington for Kapanen. See, I, I still think Shillington has more value there, but I think Kapanen, you don't bring in necessarily to be your number one, but you bring him into groom to be your number one. Yeah, that's so possible. I, I guess it depends if you want him this year or not. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about another scenario, Matt. This is a scenario that I've been talking to a few people about, and the more I've been talking to people, the more I'm going, you know, maybe it's worth trying. You and I went to a lot of the preseason games, and we both noted how well Bennett and Goudreau looked together. That's when they had Bennett playing on a center line with Goudreau and different right-wingers, usually Furlan, though. What if the Flames were to break up their first line, that first scoring line of Goudreau, um, Monaghan, and Furland, and instead go with Goudreau on the left, Bennett on the center, and someone else on the right, and then essentially move Monaghan to a second line to create a little bit more, I don't want to call it secondary scoring, but just few more lines that have a really top end forward on them. What would you think of them doing something like that? The only reason that I could see doing that right now is if Backland is no longer in the picture. Well, that is the bad thing is it moves Backland down to a very subpar line, no matter how you break it up. Yeah, and if you're not intending on keeping Backland, then I think that will probably be how that shakes out it not this season but beyond and like you could have like the three lines being having Bennett Monahan, and Jankowski as your first three centers it's just then you have to find some wingers to go with them and that you know you it's doable it's just it makes things a little bit more hectic in your going to need to rely on the prospects that are already in the A to step in to, like, say, like, Manjapani coming up on the line with Jankowski and performing. It, it could happen, but not not necessarily the best way of going about it, but if you needed to, you could. And I don't think you need to make that change now. I've created two possible scenarios here, just using existing players, where this line could work. Um, let's say we don't break up the 3M line. I think your first line would probably end up being Goudreau, Bennett, Furland, since the coaching staff likes Furland there. That would give you Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich, as we'll call them the second line, but I think in that point they would move to the third line. I made a, a line of Lazar on the left, Monahan and Yager on the right, and a fourth line of Stage and Jankowski Hathaway. You're wasting Jankowski at that point. I agree, and that's the only thing I don't like about it. If we break up the 3M line, you have a lot more possibilities, and I like the look of that lineup in that case. The way I put it together is you have Goudreau, Bennett, and Froelich as line one, Kachuk, Monaghan, and Yager as line two. I really think that could be a line that could do a lot of good things. Um, Lazar, Backlund, Furland is your third line, and then Stage and Jankowski, Hathaway is four. And I agree, you're not using Jankowski as you as much as you want to. And because of how well Janko's doing. In that case, I'd actually put Jankowski, because he is a left winger as well, I'd throw Jankowski in Kachuk's spot on the 3M line and have him with Backlund and Froelich under that scenario where you, that way you could... It, you know, because he did play left wing in his first college season, and he played left wing in his first AHL season. So it's possible that it, that could work that way. Yeah, I think if I was going to do that and put him on the left, I would probably keep Kachuk, Monahan, Yager together, and I'd do Jankowski on the left with Backlund and Furland, and then move Lazar to the center spot on line four. Um, I'm... 
I don't know. It'd be interesting to try because I think that, I mean, if I look at breaking up the 3M line and breaking up the first line, I like the look of the lineup. Now, the nice thing is you have, you know, like we were saying, we're wasting Jankowski, but you could even tell the lines, you know, play for minutes, play to see who gets the most minutes. But I like the idea of having Goudreau, Bennett, Froelich as one line, Kachuk, Monaghan, Yager as a second line. I think those are two, could be two really good scoring lines. The thing I think would be interesting about that second line is Yager's become a setup man and Monahan's become a setup man. So I think it could also get one of those two guys, likely Sean Monahan, to become the sniper on that line as well. Yeah, I could see it. Like if the Flames continue to struggle with generating offense throughout their line, something like that would work well. And I mean, we moved Bennett to left wing because they, I think a lot of it had to do, and the coaches talked about this with a lack of confidence. And I'm thinking now that he seems to get rolling, why not try him at center ice again and see what he can do there? Yeah. And throwing anybody that has skill with Gaudreau is going to usually generate good results. So yeah, it could very well work. And I think Chuck Monahan could be a good pairing too. Especially that line, uh, because Monahan's not the fastest, Kachuk's not the fastest, and Yager's not the fastest. Yeah, yeah, so it becomes fine. I think that becomes more of your sort of tactical forward line. They're not going to rush the net, but I think those are guys that can really, if they're if they are given the chance, can really play a more. I don't know if this makes sense, but a smarter forward game. I think because they are slower. It's almost like the Sedin line. That's a good comparison. Yeah. Where just everybody cycles the puck until somebody gets open and mm. you have a wide open net and shoot it in. Yeah, and I think a third line, if we do go with Jankowski on the left of Jankowski, Backland, Furland, again, I think, you know, could be a good change for Janko and get him more minutes. And I still think the only thing I don't like is you break up the Jankowski Hathaway pairing. But I think no matter how you do the third, fourth line, I don't think you necessarily have a three and four. I think they could either play equal minutes, or you say whichever line's playing better keeps playing um but those are just some ideas i had today on my lunch break trying to figure out what could you do with this lineup to essentially move some firepower around and i really like the look of it if we break up the 3m line and we break up the first line i like the look of that better than keeping the 3m line intact because with the 3m line intact i think you've almost got to put monahan down to like a line with lazar and yager and that would become a third line at that point yeah, and then you're ruining Monahan really, and that's not that's kind of pointless. <laughs> you know, you were talking earlier about the Flames may have to move on from Backland. I still think if they're going to move a center, they might move Bennett. I don't think it's necessarily the I right thing to it. do at this point. Yeah, I don't. He's playing well now, and I just don't see it. But so is Backland. He's doing well. Yeah, I know. It, it well. Ideally, I would not move Backland at all. Like, I'd keep him in the lineup. It's just that the team may decide to allocate the, say, five or six million dollars that he's going to get at somewhere else, at, which I don't think is necessarily the best way of doing it. But, yeah, I think that Backland should stay as long as possible. But that's going to be an interesting contract, too, because I don't think you can pay Backlund more than you're playing paying Monaghan. No. I think a five-year at, like, five and a half per would be, like, pretty much perfect. I think that's a little rich for Backlund. Yeah, uh, not really, though, um, because he's so good defensively. Uh, you look around the league for that generic type of guy, and five and a quarter, five and a half is about right yeah i mean we've talked about taking you know stagen's money which is three and a three and let's say three and a half round it up and give it to backland that puts him at more than monahan backland's making 3.5 this year i can see just because i can see him wanting to stay here the deal coming in about 475 four and a quarter four and a half somewhere in there anything under f like five I think is like a bargain home run contract yeah, I mean, for the Flames. If you, could, if you could essentially take Versteeg's money and dump it into Backlund's contract and be done, I think you'd you'd turn out really well. Yeah, I think anything under five and a quarter really is a home run. And anything more than that, like anywhere between five and a quarter and six, I think is 
like market value and anything more than six, you're overpaying. I think if it goes to six, I would really have to ask, could we get a better deal somewhere else? I know we like Backlund, but I don't think he's worth six. Borderline, it would be an expensive contract. He's 28, and I think my worry to go cheaper is you might have to go long term, and I'm not sure how long. I don't know if I'd want to sign him past 31, 32. I'd be fine even a six year deal. I I just think I'd that if you're fine paying him five it. million at six years, you could see a guy like Jankowski clawing his way up, and we could be going, oh crap, now there's a bad contract. I don't. Uh, he's Backlund's too smart of a player, I think, to ever become a bad contract. I think well, like not the bad, la- but I can see him being a bottom six forward making Brower money. Yeah, and at that point, I think that he would be still marketable in trade because defensive centers are always in. Like the Vancouver Canucks had no problem moving Kessler, and. Uh, I think that's basically the direct comparable for Backlund is Kessler and just a good two-way center. So I think Kessler's a little better offensively, but it's close enough. And I don't see having any difficulty moving that contract if necessary. So I think if it gets into the $6 million range, you'd have a hard time moving it without chewing some of it up. Yeah, five and a half, I think it's easy. Anything more than that, it gets a little dicey. And it also sets a precedent, too. I mean, what we pay him, I think, also sets a precedent for what we'll have to pay um, Jankowski on his, not because his contract's up at the end of this year, but I think his next contract after that, a lot of what the Backland deal is going to dictate the the Janko deal. Yeah, I agree. Matt, the last lineup question we have, which was submitted through Twitter by Rene Couture, who's at Rain underscore Couture on Twitter. He asked us, um, with Yager now coming back in the lineup, do we think that the Flames should keep the third line intact, which by that I'm assuming he means Bennett, Jankowski, and Hathaway? Or should they bring Yager in uh, on that line? Or should they put him on the fourth line to spark some offense? And we saw in the Vancouver game, for most of the game, a Brower stage and Yager line, and that's what the Flames also used in practice yesterday, was a fourth line of Brower stage and Yager. What do you think the Flames should do with Yager there? Do they bring him back on the third line? Do they keep Hathaway there and put him on the fourth? I think having Yager play on the fourth line is perfectly acceptable, and if he can spark Brower and stage him to contribute, that'd be awesome. Um... I think that as long as Yager gets used on the power play, I think that's the important thing. I don't think that... I think if we can get Brower off the power play and put uh, Yager on, we're going to see an instant improvement. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, just see how it goes and play it by ear. Like, if Hathaway struggles, then move him up, it, Yager up, and... It just depends, basically, on who's playing well. And if somebody's struggling really bad, like, say, Furlan's struggling really bad, throw Yager on the first line. It just depends. It, having Yager creates flexibility where you can shift him up and down the lineup and he'll be fine anywhere he goes. With Yager's, let's say, fragile nature that we've seen this year, I don't want to rely on him too much. I don't want to rely on him as a first or second line right winger. I like the idea, like you said, of him being on the forward line and giving him some special teams minutes. And I think it gives you that flexibility that, oh, Furlan's out for a weekend. Let's bring him up just for the weekend and put him back down. But I just think with what we've seen from him this year, he seems to be pretty fragile, that lower body. I don't want to rely on him building chemistry and then he's out again. That would be my big worry if we put him on line one. And this was our question last week. We asked you guys, what do you think they do with the Jankowski-Bennett line when Yager returns? Um, 50% of respondents on our weekly poll said keep Pathway there and find another spot for Yager, which is what Matt and I are talking about. Um, 37, 35.7% said put Yager back on the line. 7% of people said demote Furland and find someone else. And 7% also said Curtis Lazar is the answer there. So I'm not uh, not really sure what the flames will do, but I do like, I, I don't think, I don't think putting Curtis Lazar there is going to happen. I like the idea of Bennett Jankowski Lazar. Lazar is sitting on the bench right now. 
and I think he should probably be in the lineup over a Troy Brower or Matt Stajan. The weird thing right now is the Flames have Brower on left wing. And again, I'd put Lazar in there. Like Maybe I'm giving him too much rope, but I'm a Lazar fan. I like Lazar on the left wing better than I like Brower on the left wing. Yeah, so do I. I think... I think Lazar, Yager, and Stajan as the fourth line could actually get some points. Yeah, well, I think Brower, he's starting to play better. And I think he, like, he was hitting a little more, and he got into that fight, and he's generating a little bit of offense. I think if he can start getting confidence in his game, much like Sam Bennett did, I think he'll start contributing more like his, his normal... Uh, amount of points and such it's just he has to just keep doing what he's been doing lately i'm just not sure putting him on the left side is going to get him that confidence uh we'll see it, it, it's too early he's only played one game and they scored a goal so we'll see i can see though you're right if brower i mean if we can turn brower around he'd probably end up going on the third line and Yager staying on the fourth. And that could be an interesting line, too, if Bennett, Jankowski, Brower, if Brower can turn things around. Yeah. Um, Talking about the poll from last week, anything else on that that you want to discuss with lines or right wingers? Or it seems, like you said, it seems like we have no right wingers, but we have an abundance of guys that can play center. And if you need a right winger, you can always try to convert a centerman, too. Yeah, it's just all, I think all of our centers are left shots too, which that kind of makes things difficult. But they got a summer to train. Yeah, it's like saying to a pitcher, "Hey, you're doing well as a right-handed pitcher, but you know we need a lefty in our bullpen, so you know start throwing." <laughs> I'm still waiting for the guy, and I don't think we've ever seen him—the guy who can shoot either way, and you like see him switch sticks between lines based on what he's got to shoot. Yeah. Oh, I think you have to go all the way back to Gordy Howe for that. So, the ambidextrous shooter. Yeah, that's what part of the reason why he scored so many points because he'd literally switch uh, as like if he was on a breakaway, he'd literally switch hands while he's on the breakaway stick handling. And you want to talk about screwing up the goaltender? <laughs> oh yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. In in the like, age we're in now where we have, you know, like flexible phones and stuff, I could see somebody making a stick where the blade could just like bend the other way as he's skating. Yeah. That'd be neat. Get on that, Dan. Corner that market. You need somebody who could shoot both ways first, right? It's no good if the guy can't shoot both ways. So Matt, we talked about the poll from last week, talking about what to do with that third line, and this week we're going to pose the question that you've posed a few times. Is it time for the Flames to break up the 3M line, that what everyone's calling the second line of Kachuk, Backlund, and Fro Leaks? We want to hear what you guys think. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you like it in theory, but don't know where you'd put those guys? Do you think it would cause too much unrest in the lineup? Let us know what you think, and you can, as always, vote on this by going to our website at uh, our website's at firesidechat.ca. You'll see the poll on the homepage there. You can also vote on Facebook. We're facebook.com slash firesidechat. Or on Twitter. We'll have it pinned to the top of our Twitter feed, and it'll be at Fireside Podcast. So let us know what you think about breaking up the 3M line. But I wasn't a fan of it when you've mentioned it before, but when I look at not just breaking up that line, but what it could do if we look at that as a total reshuffling, then I think it becomes much more interesting. Matt, this is our last show of 2017. Can you believe it? Time flies when you're having fun. We're not going to record again next week. It's Christmas, and Matt and I are going to take some time off with our friends and family. So we will be back in January, probably around the 4th of January will be when the next show comes out, which means we've got a lot of games to look at ahead to. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six games between now and the next time we talk. So the Calgary Flames will be playing on the 20th of December, my mom's birthday, at home against the St. Louis Blues. They'll play on the 22nd at home against the Montreal Canadiens to finish up their season series. Then they get a Christmas break and they come back on the road against San Jose Sharks on the 28th. And then on the 29th, back to the Honda Center. We better not start the curse all over again. New Year's Eve, they play their annual New Year's Eve game, but this year it's against the Chicago Blackhawks in the Saddledome. And those are the games that we have until we talk next. So 
some interesting games there. Matt, I think looking at this, we can probably both agree that Riddick plays in Montreal. We were both thinking that earlier. Yeah, I think that Riddick might get the Anaheim game too, just for, or the Sharks game. Have you heard about Riddick's crazy game day ritual? Yeah, he likes getting pucks, two pucks shot off his mask, which, you know. But lightly, lightly, he says. Don't give the man a concussion. He's got to play that night. Yeah, Riddick is a normal goaltender. All goaltenders, I have, I played net myself, and I have yet to meet a goaltender who was a normal person. (laughs) They're all a little bit different. (laughs) Definitely the most interesting player on any team is usually the goaltender, because they're all a little bit squirrely, so... It's good. It's interesting. There's an article in the Calgary Sun by uh, Wes Gilbertson, if you want to read about why this guy wants to be beaten in the head. But the story goes when he was in Stockton, he was warming up with the goalie coach down there. And they were just shooting pucks. And just inadvertently, the goalie coach uh, hit him with two pucks on the mask, apologized for it. And that night, Riddick delivered a 36-save goose egg for the Heat against the Grand Rapids Griffiths. In his next game, with no chin music during prep, he was shelled for five goals. So, the tradition was born after that. And I just want light shots, he stresses over and over. Just light shots. So he's got to get hit in the head before the game. And I I can see going to your goalie coach and saying, Hey coach, I'm new to this team, but do you mind hitting me in the head with some pucks? That's a weird request to make for your goalie coach. I guess Yager was on the ice one time when he did it because Yager was there, you know, skating after practice because it's hurt. And he said, what's wrong with this guy? Well, everybody's a little different and goaltenders are definitely that. So nothing, you could say any story about a goaltender and I'd believe it. And so, because they're all just interesting. So it is what it is. <laughs> well, the the big storyline for me going into this Christmas break is will we will we go on another Honda Center curse? Do you think we can win the Anaheim game? Yep. Uh, Anaheim's struggling due to the vast amount of injuries and the fact that they don't have that monkey on their back, I think will... It's sort of like Bennett earlier in the season. When he was struggling, it, it just seemed to snowball for him. But then, like, once he got one, he was fine. And I think it's going to be the same thing with the Flames. That now that they've won in Anaheim, I don't think it'll be a problem anymore. So, Matt, five games on the table between now and the new year. Ten points total. What are you thinking for the result? They need eight. They need eight. Tough order. Yeah. And against five really good teams. And they need eight. And if they get less than six, I think you see a different coach in the new year. And I, I, I don't. So which two do you think they they lose then? I think that they're going to probably, if for what I think will happen, I think they drop St. Louis. I think they beat Montreal. I think they drop all the other three. But th- that's just based off of how they're playing. And I, I don't see them turning it around. But they need eight points. I'm a little more optimistic than you. I think they'll drop the St. Louis game. I think they'll beat Montreal. I'm going to be optimistic and say they take both of the back-to-backs, and I think they lose Chicago. I think that they've, after the San Jose game, I think they've got something to prove there, and they know it. And after a rest, I'm hoping they'll be able to come out. But at the same time, often they are not good in that Christmas game. So that to me, that San Jose game is the big intangible of the week. Yeah, that's why I'm saying like I'm expecting them to lose the last three games. It's not because of necessarily of the opponent's it's that Christmas thing for like the last three years, the games immediately after Christmas have been horrible <laughs> efforts. And it's one thing if it's after Christmas and you're at home, but here, I mean, they've got to travel on the 27th for a game on the 28th. And those are going to be late games too. I'd have to see how we play in the late games, but it seems like when we play late, we don't do well. Like everything, we'll see. And the Flames are getting into the stretch of the season where they got to start putting up or, you know, things have to change and they need six at a bare minimum and it would be better if they got eight but we'll see and then looking ahead to january it's kind of interesting they've got a four four game uh road streak in there 
four road games in a row right for their bye week. So depending on how they're looking right now, they're looking not too bad on the road. But depending on how they're looking at the road at that time, that could be a blessing or a curse. Yeah, and it's one of those things where they just need to start putting W's up and it doesn't really matter how they get there. I'm optimistic about January looking at some of the opponents that we have. Yeah, and that's why getting through the hard games right now, getting a bit on a roll, especially with a lot of the weaker opponents that we face in January, it could snowball into like a protracted winning streak where the flames start taking off it's just that they need to get going now to be on that roll so that way they can start kicking some butt yeah i don't even know if they're easier teams but i mean we play la twice we play vegas once we play winnipeg like i think if the flames can get going there's some hard matchups there but they can gain a lot of ground you've got la anaheim Minnesota, Winnipeg, LA again, Edmonton, Vegas. Like, there's a lot of ground to be made up within the Western Conference, if not within our division, in that month. And I think that's where the month of January could be sink or swim for this team. Yep. I agree. Well, Matt, I won't see you next week. You have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, as well as everyone who's listening. We hope that you have a great holiday season, enjoy some good Flames hockey, and we will be back in January to talk more about the Calgary Flames. Happy birthday to your mother, and have a Merry Christmas to all our listeners. Thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, We wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for you, so thank you for listening, and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks to you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Happy birthday, Mom. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat and to follow us on Twitter at fireside podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at the hockeywriters.com. Fireside chat is licensed under a creative commons attribution, non-commercial share alike license hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.